So, turns out the very important project I was going to do this week is not happening. My package of very specific fabric, which was supposed to be here, is currently being held hostage by the post office, so I had to really quickly come up with a different eye-catching plants because it's not quite art fight season just yet. Something that I was thinking of trying during art fight was studying different art styles I like and imitating them. But then I thought, hey, what if I did something like that, but it's also my D&D? characters. So today we are drawing two scenes from the D&D campaigns that I am in, in the style of 90s anime. Now I really wanted to actually do three or four drawings and not just two, but honestly I'm kind of short on time as is, so I had to pick two of the four campaigns that I have featured in my D&D Adventures playlists. The first one that I'm showing in the video is secretly the second one that I drew, but I want to show it first because it just ended up being a lot simpler, but also more visually like the show that I was taking inspiration from. And even with it simpler, I think it turned out really, really nice, very much like the show I was hoping it would look like. And I know that that there is only one character on screen so far, but I wonder if anyone can already tell what anime I am referencing. So everybody get your guesses in. Come on. Okay, let's see. Everybody, everybody got it. Everybody got your answers. It's One Piece. Good guesses, everyone. I decided to choose One Piece because first of all, iconic. Even though the daunting task that is actually watching the entirety of One Piece is downright terrifying to me. But but second of all, I chose One Piece because one of my non-D&D usually playing friends decided to cameo for an episode where he played as a monk called Captain Hoofy and he immediately came out of his ship and started fighting people, which as far as I know, a uh, very on brand for a Monkey D. Luffy inspired character. Also on said ship was a character named Miko, which was supposed to be a mix between Nico Robin and Nami, but I started calling her Hatsuno Miko and it changed the character character's visual appearance by drastic measures, and now she's come with us on more adventures than Captain Hoofy has, and uh, this has nothing to do with the drawing that is on screen right now, even though I did really try to think of an iconic scene to put her in, but uh, any, I just, I just, I just think it's neat. I just think it's neat. If you have watched my speed draws for my D&D parties, you might be able to figure out who these three silly little guys are. They are from left to right. Terovich, Io, and Stubb. Io being my support character using a super fun D&D wiki homebrew class called The Synergist. Stubb is a rogue who is downright excellent at being a rogue, and Terovich is an artificer and a turtle who is obsessed with flying. And let me tell you, all of us made Wisdom our dump stat, both in-game and on our character sheets. We are truly the silliest of little guys. It has been a hot minute since I've done some crispy, clean lining, but it's always so fun to go back Back to my roots. And I say roots because when I started doing digital art, it was pretty much all with line art. And up until about two years ago, line art was my primary way of doing digital art. And I still very, very much love doing line art. It's a very fun art style to fall back on when I get tired of doing my painty things. But I also think it's one of my more difficult art styles to watch in a speed draw. Cause you know, it's harsh black on white and also lots of redrawing the same line over and over and moving from one section of the piece to the next and a lot of zooming in and out, but I do really love the look of a good toothy brush with clean lines and, and, and not trying to be like prideful or anything, but I really like the way I do my line art. Obviously, I still have tons of art envy for people who are much better at line weight, people who can do the colored lines thing, but I don't know, I just feel pretty good about how this image turned out. In my opinion, most of the characters translated relatively well into the One Piece style. Stuff was pretty much a one-to-one of Luffy. I just had to move the scar from under his eye to his lip and then give him pointy ears and no shame or hate to One Piece, but for the most part in the anime, the visual differences between women are less in body and head shape and more in hairstyle, clothing, accessories, and eye shape. I did reference a couple different characters to get Ayo just so, but she is 90% Nami. The only character that One Piece didn't have a one-to-one -one for was Terovich the Turtle, which I gotta be honest, I was kind of surprised about. I'm not sure if it's because I didn't do enough research to find more One Piece turtle characters, but the only ones that I found were the actual Turtle Island and also Banji. Nothing wrong with either of these designs, but they definitely give off more creature vibes and less character vibes. The other option was Kawamatsu, who isn't even a turtle, even though he kind of looks like a kappa, he's a 
pufferfish man, I guess, apparently. So I went a little off the rails and looked for pretty much any generic looking anime turtle character and I stumbled across this guy and he had a lot of shapes that I really liked and even some very one piece adjacent traits and he's apparently from an anime called Konohana Kitan, which I have never watched and hadn't even heard of up until this point point. Uh, and all I have to say about it is good turtle shapes, nice job. So I start laying down the colors and honestly once the colors go down that's all the hard stuff out of the way for this drawing. I was going for the anime TV screen style and not the manga style. If I were doing the soft ink coloring style of One Piece, I would have been much more careful with my color choices and used much softer brushes, added a lot more hatching details, but I was distinctly going for early episode animation, so everything is very flatly filled, lots of warm tones, and very simple shading. Honestly, the severity of how simple the shading was in early One Piece episodes kind of surprised me. I mean, it makes sense with how much animation has progressed so much over the years, but a lot of the old One Piece episodes have very little to no shading on the faces of characters at all, and it just makes me really appreciative of all the work that went into animation then, and also how much farther we've gotten in how much work that is still put into animation even now. Aya was the most difficult character to color in this set because she is a changeling and consequently very pale white with cool tones, and One Piece is a very vibrant, warm, colorful anime. Luckily, there are a decent number of blue skinned characters in the anime, including Jinbei, which I know I'm saying so many Japanese names of characters in TV shows and things, please forgive me for all my mispronunciations if you haven't already, but I use Jinbei's color color scheme to sort of guide my color picks for IO. Another very key feature of 90s anime, particularly in One Piece, are these highly rendered backgrounds. Now the setting for the scene that I picked is not very interesting. It was in a dungeon, maybe a kitchen, so all I painted was a quick stone wall, blurred it, called it good. I think maybe a few more details might have sold it a little bit better, but you know, I'm not, I'm not too unhappy with it. Speaking of the scene, this is from the very first episode of the campaign, which RDM calls live of the lost. He said it was a combination of his own ideas with the structure of a very popular campaign from an older D&D module and a couple of other cool things that he discovered around the internet as a DM of many many years. In this first episode we discover we have literal ticking time bombs that have been surgically placed into our heads and at some point while we're stealing so many potatoes from the kitchen we play around with the idea of removing the devices ourselves and Io, my character, brings up ye old classic line and says, well, you know what they say, live, laugh, lobotomy, and she lays her head down on the table. Needless to say, Terevich and Stubb do not conduct surgery, so off we go to find someone who is more adept at removing surgically implanted bombs. So after adding hair shine and text to the drawing, I have to make this look more like a 90s anime TV screen capture, and the way to do that is noise and chromatic aberration. While Krita does have a sort of slider for adding a noise filter, which I think is okay, I wish there was a little bit more variation, but I don't know, you know, it's whatever. What Krita doesn't have is a way to auto add chromatic aberration, so what you do is you duplicate the layers you want to chromatically aberize, and then go to properties, uncheck all the colors except for one, and then nudge that layer ever so slightly to create that outline. Easier than I thought it was going to be, but somehow still feels unnecessary fairly tedious and complicated. But there's one piece, hehe, <laughs> get it done. So let's move on to the next one. This one was less inspired by a specific art style and more inspired by a couple of vibes, I guess? This might look more like the classic 90s anime that you are used to with a lot of inspiration from a lot of different places, but with how many different anime shows I took inspiration from, this actually might technically land less in the 90s, and actually even with One Piece I'm cutting it very close to the end of 90s to the early 2000s, but there is one Tumblr post about Cadet Kelly that says everyone knows the 90s didn't end until around 2004, and I am taking that to heart. So we have influence influences in this drawing from Sailor Moon, Inuyasha, Cowboy Bebop, and then some. Those all might be 90s animes that are technically 2000s or maybe the other way around, but you know, we're still trying to shoot within that range. You might already recognize this character either from the design or from the title of my critophile. This is Inkashti, which unless you stayed until the very end of one of my more recent videos, you might be wondering, is she dead?
dead or alive. I have good news, she is alive. We were two death saves down and I was about to be very dead, I was rolling horribly, but she does in fact live thanks to the help of a paladin in her party. Unfortunately, we did lose the commander of our group, Haskell, which is someone that I talked about in my first video in the D&D Adventures playlist. He was taken by a dragon after a very lengthy attack with some slods, which I've heard people pronounce as slades, but they're like these tall poison frog things. Anyways, we were advised by an NPC that we were not yet equipped to pursue such a creature, especially in the battered state that we were already in. And I'm saying all this not to have a pity party, but to sort of set the scene for what I'm drawing here with Inkashti. Inkashti was Haskell's right hand, the sort of face of the party with her high charisma. However, because of her nature, that is being an expendable, imperfect version of a super soldier designed by the army, she is not permitted to raise in rank. And even if she does, she doesn't have the same power, sway, or authority that someone else in the same rank would have. When Haskell the first commander died, the party turned to Inkashti as second in command to be their new leader. Where we come to this moment, which takes place after a major battle at an important gala, and Inkashti responds to her party members saying, I cannot be your commander. Much more dramatic than the last piece with Io, Terevich, and Stubb, although that trio probably doesn't take anything as seriously as they maybe should. But back to this drawing, since I wasn't imitating a particular particular style, and more just trying to translate my style into an animatable character, I had to make a lot of simplifications, especially to her dress. In her original design, she has a lot of sparkly gold filigree all over a beautiful red dress, and having that be very detailed would be just straight up horrendous for any animator, I would imagine. So I simplified the decoration on her dress a lot, as well as the charms in her hair, I got rid of any chain type things, and just did my best to make everything still readable as design elements, but not overwhelming. I use Cowboy Bebop as the major inspiration behind the color palette in this drawing. Cowboy Bebop still has a lot of very vibrant and colorful scenes, but they also use a lot of cooler undertones and jewel tones in their color choices, which I think very much suits this more dramatic scene. And I think the most interesting thing here to color was the gold. While I would be very much inclined to add shiny highlights, as sparkles and highlights are something that I feel like we associate very much with early 90s anime, probably because of Sailor Moon, most likely. I actually was looking at references of Sailor Moon's transformation um, and her wand or the moon stick, and I saw that it had little to no shiny highlights on it, just a sort of reddish shadow gradient. And so that's exactly what I did for the little gold bits on the clothing and in her hair pieces, uh, which you will see that as the speed draw continues. So the voiceover is a little bit out of order or a little ahead of the draw. Drawing. Hopefully you can forgive me for that, um, but you know, I want to talk a bit about adding filters and smaller details because these things do happen very quickly in the recording, but they do make a big difference. Uh, also, as per usual, I forgot to hit record again, so jump cut. Ooh, scary. But I think all I did was work on the background, maybe a little bit of shading, so hopefully that's okay. Again, back to the smaller details that really sell the piece, not only the chromatic aberration and adding noise, but also a little detail with the line art. To make the line art appear less harsh, and also to make those tiny bits of color where maybe I didn't perfectly stay within the line art, and to sort of help make it look less jarring, I duplicate the line art and just set a very small Gaussian blur, uh, not really noticeable as a blur on its its own, but when you add the duplicated and blurred layer, it makes a huge visual difference. I can't explain it very well, it's just art things. Speaking of layers, look how many layers I'm working with. I'm not a monster after all. I think for skin at some point I did color on the wrong layer, definitely, and I remember saying to myself, this wouldn't have happened if this was all on one layer, but in general I think the number of layers you work on is heavily influenced by the art style that you are producing. I mean, even my early your painty styles were on many, many more layers than my current painting art style is. And again, not to be prideful, but I really like working in my line art style. I'm super pleased with how the colors turned out. I think one of my only complaints is that I made a change to her hairstyle after the sketch while lining. I didn't trust the process, and now it's a little lopsided, but you know what? A little lopsided and it's, it's kind of a 90s vibe itself, right? Uh, but again, adding the blurred line art layer adding some noise, putting in the text line, which apparently I 
couldn't decide on what it should say exactly. And last but not least, which I didn't actually do in the recording, I add that good old chromatic aberration. And now the reveal! I love how both of these turned out. I really miss doing line art and I really like how it looks as I've said like seven times in this video already. But you know what I don't miss? The repeated precise pen strokes over and over. My wrist hurts horribly, which is exactly what you don't want before art fight. So I have a wrist brace coming in the mail, which will hopefully help me in my off drawing hours because you bet I'm going to do as many art fights as much as I can. Speaking of art fight, I chose Team Vampire, and I'll be honest, I chose it because my friends Terrapin and Krivitika did. I will put the link to their art fight pages in the description alongside my own, but come on, how how was I supposed to choose between vampires and werewolves? That's just so freaking cool! That being said, even if you chose Team Vampire or you want to choose Team Vampire and you're interested in receiving an art attack from me and now you feel bad because we're on the same team. That is not the case. I will attack anyone. The F in art fight stands for feral. But as always, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for 550 subs. That's insane. We're more than halfway to a thousand people. And happy, happy art fight. Last year, I think I managed to do five attacks, but this year I'm going to try and dedicate this entire month to doing art fight. So fingers crossed. Good luck to everyone on both teams. And hopefully I get to do more drawings this year than last year but who knows, not me.